going live. How am I going to hear them? I don't think you can hear anybody. Oh. They only hear you. And I think, oh, I think you're going live. Yep. Oh, you're live. Um, okay. So we're guys, if you can hear me, just type there in that little box to let us know you can hear me. Um, we're new at this, obviously. We came on live five minutes ahead of time to get some housekeeping taken care of. Um, stop yelling. Oh, stop yelling. Okay, so I could turn this down, maybe. That's good. That's good. Okay, give us some feedback. Let us know. We're good? We're good. Huh? 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 So we have Ann and Trisha right off camera here. So... Um, this will be good. I can't really see what they're... Oh, he was just kidding. He said stop yelling, but he was just kidding. Oh, okay, okay. I'll bring <laughs> it back up. <laughs> Give me some tools. Let me go work on something. Western so. New York, I think. Is that WNY? Hello from Western WNY. New York. Yes, yes. So, okay. So is the lighting good? Let me put this light on up here. Let's see what that looks like. My, my beautiful grape. There we go. <laughs> I feel like I should be reading what they're typing, but <laughs> yeah, we'll have to get you on with the comments. Okay, okay. So, guys, we're just goofing off for the first. We got three more minutes, and um, and then Ann and Trisha are going to start pumping questions over here on that screen, and uh, then I'll I'll start answering questions live. Um, this is our first opportunity to kind of to practice some of these things. We were going to do it with the camera that I normally use for my other videos, uh, my phone. And, but for some reason, we had some problems. So in the last five minutes, we scrambled and got my Surface PC up here, and we're trying to get the audio figured out, the video figured out, lighting figured out. And um, so, yeah, and uh, there's no way I'm going to keep up with all those comments, but that's what Anna and Trisha are going to be working with you guys on. So there's a little bit of housekeeping. Patrick Stiltner says, you must be getting ready for rain. Uh, it's pouring down rain outside. Normally, I think that if we start doing more and more of these, and if this becomes a real popular thing, we'll put me out in the shop, which is where I really want to be right now, but it's raining. And um, since this is our first time, we wanted to have Ann, Trisha, and me all together. Sid would be another fun one to have with us. Sid's the one that does all of our editing. Uh, Trisha's the one that does all of our office management. Ann is my wife. She's the one that does the, the money part <laughs> and um, ordering of parts. And um, so we just put us all in, this is our old RV. This is the RV that we're in. You might recognize, it looks like an RV. Uh, we bought this RV in 2007 and it was our very first RV. And this is why I became an RV technician. We were buying this, we bought this RV to get me, I was an engineer, we would go to different jobs throughout the United States doing airport jobs and um, um, fell in love with RVing, fell in love with fixing RVs. And here we are, and now we're talking to you. So um, are we ready? Oh, two more minutes. I got to stop for two more minutes. What are we going to do? Gonna you wanna do? hear where people are calling or are logging in from? Yeah, yeah. Let's hear where everybody's coming from. So I'll say it and then maybe you can say it so they can hear for sure. Okay. So we've got um, Ray from Morris Plains, New Jersey. New Jersey. Yay, hey, Ray. And um, oh, we got someone local, Bremerton. Bremerton. Wow. That's a long way away. We're the and, same time zone at least. <laughs> uh, North Carolina. Looks North right. Carolina. Yeah. Good. Good. And oh, this is exciting. Cool. Sacramento, good. Sacramento, California. Perry, Georgia. Can you guys hear Trisha? Here, here's Trisha. Come on. No, don't show me. Oh, no, we're. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Trisha's. Uh, Ottawa, Canada. Oh, hey, wow. our Canadian cousins. Um, Oregon, Tennessee, Florida. Very cool. Okay, this is fun. Okay, well, good. This is turning out. Um, because for the first gosh, few minutes, there was like one person logged in, and it was Trisha. And we're like, well, what are we going to do if nobody logs in and and, and joins us? So it's kind of like, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to just print out some questions and I'll just fill time answering questions like we do with our 10 minute Q&A. So um, right now we're at 54. 54. Woo! This is exciting. So um, 56. so let's, not, um, I, I think we're close enough. We, we yeah. can get going. So um, shoot me a question. One of you ladies, just, just yell it out. Okay. Well, so just let them know that they okay. can put their questions in now and to just okay. start with a Q at the beginning. Here, here. Okay. I need to get two microphones. Okay, so you can start with uh, posting your questions. Just put a cue in front of the question, and we'll start posting them, giving them to Darren to answer. Okay. Hopefully, can y'all hear her okay? Oh, we heard her loud and clear. Oh, good. Okay, excellent. <laughs> can you, if I keep this on, say, go through the alphabet ABC. Could you hear her if she says ABC? What ABC. Could you hear that? Can you hear me now? Now the wind's picking no, up no, outside. That's okay. Okay, okay. So... Um, Trisha will will ask will ask your question or Anne. Okay, we're and we're in a storm outside. Very exciting. Very windy. 
Um, so if we lose power, we love you guys, and we'll we'll figure out how to get back. So well, why don't we start with the flip meter from our recent video, and you can kind Good. of give some information about that. Okay. And then we can go for our first question. Okay. What we wanted to do was we wanted to start it out with a couple <clears throat> um, uh, comments, statements. So the one of the videos we just put out, gosh, a week or so ago, was the one where I did all the, 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 the tank monitoring sensors. And I had all my meters laid out, and each one could tell a story. And um, there was quite a few of these high-end fluke meters that weren't reading any of those sensors. And I even brought in this sheet um, that tells us the values we were reading. Turns out there was nothing wrong. There's a leaf. It turns out there was nothing wrong with the meters. It turns out that the specification of the fluke meter, the, the top of that reading is 40,000 ohms. And so the meter itself was rated for 40,000 ohms. Nothing wrong with that. I use these meters not for really monitoring ohms. I use them for looking for voltages and things. And so this thing, if the if the meter tops out at 40,000 ohms, and then this guy right here says he's looking for 66 or 68,000 ohms or 188,000 ohms, well, those are greater than 40,000 ohms. So that is why those meters were not working. Um, so I did want to throw that out for everybody. And... Um, if one. if we get bored, I do have several go to questions. If if we're just like sitting around staring at each other, so okay, um, okay we got a question. So I'm gonna hold the phone. Or uh, here, Trisha's gonna. I wonder uh, if I did this. Alice. Uh, let me do this. Let me do this. I'm gonna put the lavalier right there. So but before we answer, can everybody hear me? If I leave the lavalier there, and can you hear Trisha if I leave the lavalier there? Anybody? Right, so Anybody? we've got question one from Alice Linders. Okay. If you don't want your name to be included, just say anonymous, and we want to, I'll try not to include it. Yep, everybody um, can hear. So okay, good. We'll leave the lavalier right there, and I'll just go with this. Okay. So Alice Linders says, I have a problem with my leveling system. When I raise the leveling jacks, it makes a screaming noise. Mm -hmm. She's from Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, I'm going to assume it's a lippert. Or is it a, a did not say HWH or Lippert? But Alice, or if Bigfoot. you want to say, uh, I'll try to catch your comment and see. I'm just moving the wire. There we go. The wire was caught. Okay, so that scraping noise could be an indication that the seal inside your cylinder has failed. Um, so if you've got a scraping noise, mm, they do have seal kits. It depends on the manufacturer of the leveling jack. Um, HWH has a lot of um, seal kits. But um, Lippert has some seal kits too, but sometimes they just make them so you just replace the whole thing. Um, what can I get for you? Oh, that was Ann. So if it's a scraping, if it's a scraping noise, more more likely there's a, a, a fault inside of the cylinder where that ram is scraping the inside. Not the best answer. Um, now, while we're on the, the leveling things, some of you might hear a popping sound, which is not the question, but some of you might hear a popping sound. It'll be nighttime and, and you're trying to get some bed and you'll just hear a pop, a subtle little audible pop. Overwhelmingly, those are going to be with your Lippert uh, systems. And um, if you do have that, Lippert has what's called a, a lip sheet. It's like a, tick, a tech sheet. And um, what you're going to do is you're going to get your leveling system so you can exercise all the jacks. And so that means you're going to have to put it up on your truck or something. And you're going to take a, you're going to retract everybody back in. So all the fluids back in the reservoir, and then you're going to take a quart of the ATF Dextron 3 out, and you're going to add a quart of anti-stiction fluid. Okay. And then you're going to exercise all your jacks and then um, you're going to try it up to a maximum of two quarts, but that will fix your popping sound. So that's what I got for your scraping. And then I threw that extra bonus in for the popping sound. Um, All right. Do you want another one? Let's go for another one. Yay. Okay. Patrick Stiltner. Patrick. Um, so this is going to be uh, kind of just about the YouTube channel and okay. the video platform. So he says, I subscribe to your new video platform. Any difference between that one and YouTube? So I think he's talking about Rumble. Okay. So guys, what we've done um, recently as of November 1, like just a couple of days ago, um, we've had quite a few comments. We read comments. People send us emails and comments that they would they they love our content, but they're for whatever reason. I'm not going to get political or anything. They just don't want to watch our content on YouTube, maybe because of the ownership or whatever. So I'm not going to judge anybody by that. And so um, a lot of people have reached out to us asking if we could also publish our content on Rumble. And then Rumble has also reached out to us saying that they would help us do that. And so as of, we've been working on this for, gosh, two, three months, I think. So as of November 1, I think there's three videos up there now. Two of them are letting you know that we're going to go live. Um, 
And then the other one is that furnace thing that we just published a couple of days ago. So we'll be populating more of our content on our brand new Rumble channel. And um, so we do have Rumble. Basically, it's going to be the same videos. We're not going to have some on Rumble and some on YouTube. And um, and so we're just trying to get more information out to people. Uh, we also have a Patreon channel and Patreon. We might do the ideas. In fact, we just did a tour of my service trailer. Um, and I don't think that's been published yet. OK, but it's going to be a really detailed tour of my service trailer. That is only going to be for our Patreons. And so we're going to do because we're really trying to build the, the, the value of, of Patreon. If you're going to support us with Patreon, we want to do something more than just like, OK, yeah, here's the same video that everybody else gets to see. So if you want to tour the service trailer, um, you'll see that one on Patreon. When we publish it, we're still putting it together. And um, one of the things that Ann, Trisha, and I are working on is there's some folks that are interested. Down just a minute. Talking too loud? Maybe. Somebody said screaming noise. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, um, so what I was going to say on the, um, so between the three of us back here that are running the business, there's several f viewers that are also mobile RV service guys. And we've been doing this for a while. And there's some best practices that we can share with you. And so we're also putting together some content on our Patreon channel on how to start, maintain, and operate mobile service business. So um, hopefully that's a question on the YouTube platform, the, the new Rumble platform, and our Patreon platform. And we have a very strong desire to start. Trisha, should I mention the, the other thing that we're working on? No, I don't uh, know what that is. <laughs> uh, the Tech Academy? Uh, Are we ready for that? It. It, this I might mean, be a little you premature. Can, you can tell people that we want to do it. We have ideas okay. about it. Here's here's another thing we're working on. Uh, it's a it's a great idea. Uh, it's it's a great passion of mine. And we read the comments, and we read the emails, and we read the text message. And there's a lot of people that that I guess we could figure out if I could can figure out how I'm doing what I do and can it and sell it. We'd be like awesome. It'd be done. But um, we're trying to come out with a format like a LinkedIn learning format or a lynda.com format where it's a course that you would take. Um, uh, sitting around here, uh, there in these binders back here, I've got a 50 page outline on LP, 50 pages. Am I a nerd or what? 50 pages. But I went into the biology of what happens when you inhale propane, what it does to your body, why we die from it, talk about how it's processed at the refinery. Um, and then, of course, all the different things that it goes through in the RV. I, I'm going to be cutting open regulators. So that type of stuff I would not do on a YouTube channel or Rumble channel. That kind of stuff where we're going to do lab and lecture will be on our RV Tech Academy is what we're going to start. You're not going to take my academy and go get certified, but you'll take the course. We'll have some handouts. You'll have to answer some questions at the end of the module to go to the next course and um, or the next part of the module. And then you'll get a certificate of completion because you've you've dealt with Darren's, you know, 50 pages of. And, um, and then I'll do on electricity and meters and we'll go through all the different appliances and things like that. But we're we're not we haven't even started that. <laughs> so but it's our desire to, to do that. Okay, so why don't we go to some RV specific questions? Okay. And um, if your question pertains to a specific unit that you have, if you can give us the manufacturer and the model number, because that can help sometimes. Um, but so Lane Fry asks, what could be causing an? <laughs> we have cats too. Yes, there's um, What could be causing an airflow fault if the high limit switch is good and there is no obstruction on airflow anywhere in a furnace? Okay, so the question is, okay, it's a furnace, a high flow fault. Help me understand high flow fault. Oh, airflow fault. Airflow fault, airflow fault. If the high limit switch is good. Okay, so are we talking sale switch, the proof switch, sale switch fault? Oh, I don't know. It just says, what could be causing an airflow fault if the high limit switch is good and there is no obstruction on airflow anywhere in a furnace? Uh, question five on our screen, if you want to look on there. Um, so I'm going to think, is I'm, I'm it was Patrick? Lane Fry. Lane. Lane. Are we talking sales switch here? Okay. I'll look for that. See if uh, okay. So, we move on to the next one. While we well, to okay. So if it's sales switch, uh, those things do fault. I mean, they're kind of, they race to the bottom, the cheapest bidder on those things. Um, everybody, the knee jerk reaction on the sales switch is it's a sales switch, it's a sales switch, it's a sales switch. And the sales switch could be made. I mean, understand that that Suburban and Atwood are not making sales switches. These are things that are made at a sales switch manufacturing plant, you know, and they just buy them by the thousands and thousands. And uh, sometimes they get a bad batch. Um, 
but um, so if it's a sales switch question versus airflow, because there's nothing in that furnace that tells you airflow, it would be the sales switch would be your airflow. It's a proof switch. So I'm wondering if it's a sales switch problem. Um, so. Okay, I can move on. So we have L Rad no. says, have you been having any concerns with units now coming with hose LP lines instead of black and copper underneath? My understanding is it's not to code. Okay, um, the code on that is up to 60 inches, you're good. Um, I have no problem with the hoses. The hoses do have to have, the, this is out of my, my class, my notes, okay? So the hoses themselves have to, it, it's an accessory or an, um, uh, they have a name for it, where you, it, it's not a serviceable part. So the hose itself would have to have stamped on the hose its rating. Um, I believe it's 60 inches is the length of the hose it could be, um, where the where you're downstream of the regulator, you're only exposing those hoses to six ounces of pressure. So it's not a fault there. Um, the, the big challenge of the hoses is upstream. Um, that's where a lot of the oil is coming from. Um, so as far as copper, as far as uh, black pipe, galvanize, all these different things, I don't have a problem with hoses. All manufacturers are doing them that way. Um, I think the code on that is up to 60 inches. Um, Maybe somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 60 inches is the length of, of those hoses from the regulator to the appliance, um, which is five feet. So don't have a problem with the hoses. Uh, we've got a fun one. Oh, a fun one. Okay. I like fun okay, ones. Okay. From, I think it's Jorge. Okay. Um, he says, what's your hardest tech service call you dread? And I think Ooh. I know which one it is or one of them at least. Okay. Um, uh, uh, okay. I have several. Um, I think the one that everybody's going to think I'm going to say, which is true, is going to be like anything having to do with tanks and yep. waste. Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, there's a reason for that. And okay. So th the ones I really hate are ones that involve rodents. Uh, in fact, if, if you've had a rodent infestation in your RV and they've chewed your wires and they've chewed your, your plumbing lines and stuff, I would rather work on a tank than work on a rodent problem. And it's even so bad where I, I at this point, I, if you tell me that you have a rodent infestation and it's caused problems in your RV, I, I'm probably not going to not going to take that. I've seen rodents total brand new RVs. It's just they get in places that you just can't service and they're dealing with all the rodent waste. Who wants to do that? So the worst, worst would be a black tank job in an underbelly that you have to take down that had rats and all kinds of animals up there. So you're taking the underbelly down and all the poop and everything is there. And then you're working on the tank. That is like the worst ever. Um, so yeah, it would be those. Having said that, we use flat rate for all of our calculations on our task time. And if you're familiar with how the flat rate works, we use a spader manual. Now that's, and how much is that? $400 a year? It's, it's, it's an expensive, it's, it's in the neighborhood of $400 a year that we pay every year. And what that does is that gives us the book. Um, we, bit, we get it as a, as a, as a, as a um, the software version. And um, it's over like 7,000 tasks. And as a mobile guy, I'm not doing half of the stuff that's in that book. You would need a shop and they do mechanical and brake line. And I'm not doing anything mechanical. I'm just working on the RV house stuff. But my there is black work. We call it like black tanks and tanks and stuff. It pays better. It pays more. So you can, if, if you're okay wearing the gloves and everything, you're not going to get any diseases because it needs a living host. The, the, the bacteria and everything needs a living host to, to survive. Um, it's going to be nasty and it smells bad. Gloves, wash your tools, sterilize everything. But if you go by the flat rate, the, the tank work and the plumbing work and the waste work pays much better so that is to say, if I go out and work on a job and I'm physically there for one hour to do a physical job that physically took me one hour, um, the, the the flat rate might pay me two hours to do the job because I guess they take into consideration that nobody wants to do that kind of work. But rodents are also really, I hate working in rodent stuff. And even to the point where I just simply, if it's a rodent infestation, I just, I just I'm, I'm not going to do it. Um, so there's that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Keith asks, can you use flex seal rubber roof to seal your roof, your RV roof? Uh, flex seal would be like an Eternabond product. So Eternabond, um, yes, if it's a small seal, if it's a small hole. Now I'm going to say you're saying flex seal, but Eternabond, flex seal, I believe they're the same things, just different trade names. Um, it's, it's not like just pulling a piece of that stuff off and stick it on your roof. 
um, if you, I'm, I'm going to stay with the Eternabron name. There's two products you would use first before you put that Eternabon on or that Flex Seal on. The first thing you need to do is you need to clean that roof really, 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 really well. And they have a product that you would spray. If we were in my shop and it wasn't storming outside, we would go out to the shop and I would actually show you the products. So the first thing you're going to do is going to clean that roof really, really well. Oh, Flex Seal. And just showed me a picture of Flex Seal. It's like a paint. Is that the paint stuff? I'll finish the Eternabon story, but then the Flex Seal thing. Yeah, two totally different Totally ones. different things. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, since I started the Eternabon thing, I'll finish that. But apparently Flex Seal is different than Eternabon. Um, so since I started my Eternabon story, let me just finish that. So you clean your roof really, really well with cleaner. And then you pray primer down, the primer product. Then you apply your Eternabon tape which is Flex Seal is different. And then what I usually do is I J-roll that really, really well because it's pressure activated. And then I'll take some um, EPDM self-leveling sealant and I'll go around all my seal. So that's a turn on. Flex Seal, I'll be honest, I'm not, I've never worked with that. I've never worked with a Flex Seal product. But again, if if, if your roof is not clean, it's not going to stick. It's like putting a Band-Aid when you're all oh, sweaty. I lost audio. Uh -oh. I lost audio. It says video feed and only freezing for a second or two. Okay, let me look at something. I just want to make sure. I'm just going to come up here real quick. I just want to make sure I'm on the right network here. And yeah, I'm on 5G. Okay, yeah, so I'm on a good uh, network. Closing that. Technical difficulties. Isn't this exciting? Um, so I'm waving my hand. Do you see the hand waving? It's back. It's We're back. back. Okay, okay, good. Well, like, like we said, it, it, it's... Strong winds and raining outside. So, and we're going through Starlink. Yay. We're going Wi Fi to Starlink up into the cloud back down to you. So it's kind of exciting. Because we've got nothing out here, right? Yeah. Where, where we live, guys, out in Joyce, is we don't even get a cell signal. And um, so it's a wonderful place to go camping. And uh, when we moved here, before we had any internet, it was we had to drive to town just to kind of make a phone call and do everything. So, as far as Flex Seal, I've never worked with that. Um, roofs. Moment. Okay, so somebody said they okay. had to close and reopen and it was good. Okay. Um, so somebody's saying no audio, but it, okay, so it sounds like we're good to go, but if you are having trouble, you might need to exit and go back in. Okay. So what Trisha said, if, if it's glitching, exit and come back in and we'll still be here, hopefully. So, okay. so on the flex seal thing, um, uh, I'm not familiar with that product. I've never used it. So I, I can't really give an opinion on it. I have used a lot of a turnabon and I fixed a lot of roofs, but I haven't worked with a flex seal. I've been on a lot of roofs that I guess that's that rubberized paint. Um, and I've seen that they put that on. And um, so I'm up there working on something else. And it looks like if it was applied properly, it looks good. Um, I do know that I think it's, there's that uh, forever roof. I don't, I don't remember what it's called. Um, it's a, like a lifetime warranty. You clean your roof really well, make sure it's going on a good product, and then you put product A down, and then you put product B down, and it's like an epoxy reaction type. Um, but again, I've never worked on that. We don't do too much with roofs. I know, believe it, we live up here where roofs would be awesome, and there's a tremendous call for roofs. Um, I did a business plan a couple years ago where I was going to go to the airport and get one of these little food service trucks that raises up and has that little platform to load the carts. And I thought that would be awesome to pull that truck up to an RV where your platform's there and your 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 tools are there. And the trailer would be like one of these little cherry picker things that you can set up and get your gutter around. We When we started our business in Texas, we did roofs. That's a young man's job. <laughs> um, but roof work, you could do, you could make a killing on just doing roof work. It's desperately needed. And um, the thing that would make that really well is to have the right equipment. And so I always visualize a food service truck and a little, little cherry picker type trailer um, you know, um, I call them trade pickers. Um, the thing that moves around with an arm, you can get in it and maybe you lift up the air conditioners and things like that. So, but okay. What else we got? Let me get All some right. tea. So Dean says when putting a check valve at water pump should, okay, I'm just going to read it as it is. Maybe you can. Okay. Let's check valve on a water pump. When putting a check valve at water pump, should it from fresh water side or okay. other side of water pump? Okay, on your check valve, it's going to have an arrow, and you're, I think I understand your question. So a lot of times what we run into is these pumps, they still work, 
but they, when you're filling your fresh water or when you're on city water, it'll leak through the pump head and go fill up your fresh water tank. Um, so a lot of times where I will put that check valve, Dean, is on the out feed side of the pump. Okay. So here's my pump and, and the pump is pumping in this direction. And I'll put the check valve out feed of the pump before it goes into the house um, is where I would put those. Uh, because it's the pump impellers and the pump head and they have repair kits. And we've done some videos where we've shared swapping out the pump and how to know what's right and everything. And there's all these repair kits, but as a mobile service guy, I'm not going to get into the problem of replacing that pump head. You guys can do it, but I'm going to put a new pump on because there's a warranty um, that comes with a manufacturer with that. Um, and um, because I don't want to have to do another callback if, if, if now the pump pump is bad, you, you see what I'm saying? So I'm just going to replace the whole thing. Uh, ensure success, get in, make the repair, do a good job. We back up our work with a 90 day worksmanship warranty. And then the manufacturer has their warranty. And so um, I've gotten out of the, the patchy type jobs, but anyway, Dean, to your question on the, um, the check valve, Darren would put it between the pump and the house pressure side. So as you connect to city water and that pressure builds up, it's not going back into the pump, which might be the thing that's failed and allowing water to go back into your freshwater tank. Okay, Dave. All right. Randy says, my bedroom slide out has two worn tracks on the underside. Uh, two worn tracks? Worn. Okay, okay. I need to know what to adjust. Rack and pinion system seems to work and sound okay. Worried about the wear on the underflooring. Okay. So my question was, is this a drop floor where it's like the old power gear? It's got the two rams that go in and out and they've welded the tooth rack bar facing down. And then you would have two gear packs that are either 18 tooth or 15 tooth that are running. Um, I'm going, I'm going to assume that's what you've got. Randy. Okay. Um, so if you've got some wear spots, I'm wondering if that's on your gear packs. And again, if we were in my shop, I could do a show and tell. So stay tuned for more of these things. And we'll put me in the shop where I could actually show some things, get my hands all dirty. So if you've got some flat spots, I'm curious if it's the rack that they weld to the bottom of that ram. Um, this slide room right here has one of those. In fact, that slide room right there has one of those. The welded ram, the welded tooth bar, I'll call it the tooth bar on the bottom. Th that's welded. You're going to have to grind that off and put a new tooth bar. If it's the wearing on the teeth, Keith, um, those gear packs are like 50 bucks or so. You just take a jack, jack, take the weight off of it and a couple bolts and the full thing comes out and you put a new one in. Um, I've done several jobs recently where they've used the wrong lubricant. And um, on those rams, what I want you to do is, is, is touch it and see if it's sticky. And every one we've done recently where they were thinking, we've had a... Um, we were like the third company to come in and make the repair and they kept replacing the motors and um, all it needed to be, all that needed was to be degreased. We needed to degrease because whatever using was sticky um, on, on that. But you're saying where spots. Um, if you could get a picture to us, I can give you a better, more accurate answer because they also have these little plastic pieces that you snap in that it rides along. But um, since I mentioned lubrication, um, if that's a properly working system, I wouldn't lubricate it at all uh, because as, as it's rolling, there's a big steel roller way up under the floor that's pushing up against the ram kind of a thing. The cantilevered part up inside is a, is a big steel roller. And then you've got your gear pack. And then on the left and right and top, you've got these little plastic poly bushings and that's your lubrication. You know, okay. So a lot of the, a lot of folks are spraying them with this foamy white stuff and it's getting really sticky. So go touch yours, and if it's sticky, you gotta get that off. Just get some simple green, um, scrub it, and get all that sticky stuff off of it. And um, that should make it work better. But if it's a flat spot, I'd, I'd like to know where the flat spot was on that. All right, we got a nice just comment. Just wanna yeah. give a shout out to Daniel. And he says, thanks to you, I was able to find and repair an electrical fault in my RV. Yay. Um, so, Thanks, Daniel. And it's always really nice to hear um, 
you know, when you put out content, do you hope that it's going to help somebody? It's always mm -hmm. nice to hear that it actually does. Yes, that's good. That's why we do this. Yeah. So, and then Frank has a question. He says, my fifth wheel has a ball cable so slide and the slide is not square okay. in the opening. The okay. slide wall goes into a recessed area on the outside wall. How okay. do I square the slide in the opening? Ooh, okay. On those BAL systems, um, it's a very simple system, but of all the slide rooms I work on, they're the ones that I, I don't like <laughs> personally. Um, but um, so when those, it, it, it you'll have to gain access to that motor and that chain, and then you've got some turnbuckles. And sometimes in order to gain access to that, you got to take a whole fascia, <coughs> sorry, you got to take the whole fascia off the, um, the inside of the slide room just to get to that kind of stuff. And so sometimes that's, screws and nails and stuff but let me get some water okay um so once you gain access to the, your, your turnbuckle and your chain and everything it's really the relationship um what you're going to look at is watch the thing go in and out and you really want to look at your chain because there's going to be the motor is going to have like two gear sprockets and one chain is going to go this way one chain is going to go that way and you want to make sure that that chain is kind of centered with respect to the other chain. Um, so the first thing you're going to do is make sure that when the system's all the way out, you have like so many links here. You have so many links here. When it's all the way in, so many links here. So you really want to make sure that that's even. Once you've started with that point, then it's a matter of bringing your room in and bringing your room out and turning those turnbuckles. Um, now, it depends on if you have a drop floor BAL system or just an in and out BAL system. Um, the drop floor system, you are going to want to leave a little bit of slack in there. Um, usually when we're called in to work on these systems, because the gear is are stripped out, it's on a drop floor and they had the cables too tight. And when that room made that transition to go down, um, it just bucked the cable and it ate the gearbox. Um, so make sure you don't have a loose gearbox. On the gearboxes, there you'll, you'll see this little deformed area. And um, oh, and I oh, do have something additional from him. He's so, got an add-on comment. Okay. Um, I adjusted the turnbuckles, but okay. it doesn't square the slide up and down. It squares in and out, but not up and down. Oh, it's not up and down. Okay. Um, those are hateful. I hate working on those. Um, the video I did on the BAL system that one goes back like two years, three years. Um, we were having problems with that exact problem on that slide room. And I took my jack and I jacked up on the outside corner to make the room square. And I made all my adjustments and I took the rack, the, the jack out and it, it still kind of was off a little bit. Um, and so the only way to do that is to tighten the cables even more, take the weight off of it, tighten your cable. The cables rated for like what? 20,000 pounds. It's a ridiculous weight. So the cables can handle the weight. Um, but like I said, those are very challenging. I'd much rather work on um, what, like the, the Schwintech are my favorites um, or the hydraulics or something. But these cable systems, they're very lightweight. Um, you can get to all the parts overwhelmingly. But yes, I do have a big challenge. And I think a lot of other techs have challenges getting these things squared up, especially if it's one of these slide rooms that has a refrigerator and a pantry and a kitchen. And it's just got so much weight and you're going cantilevered out. And the only thing that's holding it in is these cables. So what I would, what I've done in the past is just get my floor jack or one of my, my hydraulic, that orange thing you see me use. And I'll just take the weight off of that cantilevered point, tighten my cable and take my jack off to see if that squared it up and then tighten the cable again. And you just got to keep playing with it. Um, what's, what could really get bad is if it's been like that for a while and the room kind of fatigues to where it kind of torques itself a little bit. So now you're overcoming the, the fatigued room where the whole room has been hanging out for a while down like that. And so one side over here is square, but this side's kind of just fatigued over a little bit. Those are really hard to overcome. I don't even know if you could. Um, so not the best answer. It's not like, oh, we'll do this, this, this. It's just one of these art things that you just keep having to tweak and fuss with until you get it just right. And they're really a bear sometimes to get done. Um, sorry, it's not the best answer, but that's, yeah, that's my, my take on those things. 
I'll tell you his last comment and then I'll move on to the next Okay, question. okay. One more comment so on he that. He said he saw the video, which I don't know. Okay, yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah. Okay, he said that was great. I moved the end of the cable on the inside bracket and it seemed to work somewhat. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, you just got to tighten it really, really tight. And what's really scary is if it's a drop floor, um, now you're running the risk of there's a little teeny drive shaft between the motor and the gearbox. And so I always tell people to carry an extra one of those. They have two different sizes, a skinny one and the big one. And then, um, so on those, I, I the, the gearboxes are like $200 or they used to be. So I would carry an extra tool. I've never had a motor go bad on those systems. It's always that little drive shaft or definitely the gearboxes. And then I think for like 20, less than 30 bucks, you can get the cable repair kit. So if you have one of those BAL systems, uh, we'll, we'll put a link in. Um, it's an affiliate link. You can get all these parts on Amazon. And uh, so I would at least have a gearbox, that drive shaft, and one of those cable repair kits in my emergency repair kit. Um, but I don't know that I would have a motor. I don't think I've ever had a motor go bad. It's always the drive shaft or the gearbox or the cable. And overwhelmingly, when it's the cable, it's because when that slide room comes in, let's say this is the slide room and here's my cable. It, you want it to be perfect. And sometimes, the, let me get a little closer, the cable comes in and it's stretching like that and it always breaks right there. And so if this is my slide room, you need to bring your your um, your bracket down so it comes in totally square with the pulley. So hope that helps. And I think I mentioned some of that stuff on that video, but gosh, that's several years ago that I did that video. But um, information is still good, so that's cool. All right, what else we got? Okay, so just a shout out to Randy. Thanks for letting us know. Um, yeah, they watched our videos and they helped you. Appreciate good. that. Thanks, Randy. And um, that's why we do what we do. That's why we do what we do. Yes. And then uh, Scott says, can I use a suburban circuit board on my Atwood 8531 LV furnace? So newborn, some new boards have different white power connectors. Overwhelmingly, okay, on the furnace, overwhelmingly, yes. If you really want, if you already have the board, great. But if you need a board, then the go-to there is a Dinosaur Electronics Fan 50 plus pins. Uh, that is a Swiss Army knife of boards. They're fantastic. But the theory of operation is the same on those boards. Um, it's What you're looking at with those boards is called DSI, direct spark ignition. So a lot of times those same boards would work on your water heater, would work on your furnace, would work on a Dometic water heater, an Atwood water heater, suburban water heater, um, Dometic furnace, suburban furnace. Um, so yes, the, the, the little white harness that you have that'll plug uh, usually the yellow wires ground so just make sure that it's ground they, they try to make an idiot proof where one side's got a bigger slot and you plug the thing in um but yeah the theory of operation is the same on those boards um so should not have a problem on that okay and the vagabond c says uh back to hydraulic lippert leveling systems okay lippert hydraulics yeah where would you start with troubleshooting front landing gear drifting after fully retracting? Front landing gear drifting. So you've got it set. You've done your auto level and it's done. You're going camping and the thing is sinking back down. Is that what's happening? Which might go back to the anti-stiction fluid problem. Um, you may also have a loose um, um, valve. Um, so on your valves, go back to your manifold where all your parts are. Um, uh, I believe they have, so I'm getting that and HWH. I think you, it's a, uh, I wish I knew what size Allen key that was. It's a small little tiny S five sixteenths. I, I don't know. It's a small little Allen key. You can figure it out. And I think you tighten it and loosen it. Anyway. Here, here's, here would be the answer that I would give you for that. It sounds to me that one of your solenoids is not closed all the way, okay? And that would be why it's leaking. Now, in some of those leveling, leveling systems, the solenoid is actually on the jack leg itself, okay? It may not actually be at the manifold. It might actually be on the, on the jack leg. Um, usually, it's the street side, but just look for those things. Um, LCI1. Here's your website. LCI1 dot com lci the number one dot com and then they've redone their that's lippert's website they've redone their website recently but on the left hand side you're going to look for the support tab on the left hand side of that and then you're going to support you want support documents i'm there frequently can't remember all this stuff but i do know i can i can count to three and um i got lci1.com memorized 
And so you're going to go to the support documents and then you're going to go to leveling systems and it'll ask you electric or hydraulic and this, not the other. But in the hydraulic side of your ground control system is where you're going to find out what size Allen key and how many turns to turn it. Um, we did a job, gosh, a year ago. And again, it, we, we get called in after like the third or fourth people to work on these things. And all it was, was one of their uh, solenoids was, was not closed all the way and it was leaking through. So look for that, for that. So there's a website where all your documentation and, um, I remember you tighten it and loosen it a quarter. It's it's a weird thing, but it's all in the manual. Um, Great, and Anne's posting that in the comments right now. Okay, good. LCI1.com. I'm not even reading the comments. That's what Anne and Trisha are helping me with. <laughs> um, okay, so you ready for the next one? I'm ready for the next one, yes. Dean says, on my Myra, Myra? Yep, Myra yep, yep. control for all controls. What would I do if out camping and it shuts down? I have no switches to override. Okay. Is this that um, uh, you have this little fob that controls all of your lights and your air conditioner and your tanks? Is that because uh, Lippert has the one control, Dometic has a system, Jayco has a system. Is this kind of what we're talking about? Mm, don't know. Let's see if he used comments, but. So if. Oh, if, yes. He said. Yeah, okay. Okay. So. Um, what you're going to need to do is all those wires that that physically connect to a, a, we, in, in my previous career, we call it a discrete IO, a real world physical connection is discrete IO. So all those lights and those leveling jacks and everything, they, they do physically go to a gigantic, not a gigantic, but a, a board. Um, and your remote control thing is controlling all that. And so it would behoove you to know where that board was to familiarize yourself with that board. And, um, I'm a big fan of, of doing um, fair weather diagnosis. So, so if this was my RV, I would basically sabotage it myself, pretend like the system broke and then get your schematic when it's, when, it, when you're not camping, you're at home, it's a beautiful day. You print out the schematic and you figure out what all these wires do. Sometimes it makes a horseshoe, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, nine, nine. and um, I would figure out where those wires go. And if the manufacturer didn't label those wires, I might get a label maker, you know, something like, can you guys see this thing right here? There you go. Um, and, and I'd label those wires. And then I would find a good power uh, 12 volt source. And sometimes the ground might be there, but then all that big fancy board is doing is just, it's a relay. Okay. It's so what I'm saying is you then become the relay. But for you to become the relay, you need to know where that wire goes. This one goes to the water pump. This one makes my slide extend. This one makes my slide retract. And so the board is just a fancy switch, okay? And your fancy um, phone app or, or fob or whatever is basically turning the switch on and off. He says it's light switches or Wi-Fi. Okay, but, okay, so your light switches are Wi-Fi. But guess what? There's still a wire going to that light, going to either the switch but the switch, follow the wire. Okay, so follow the trail. So the light has a wire going to it. It's got 12 volts feeding that fixture. <clears throat> follow that down to your mirror system. I think I'm saying that right. And then you then, because you got your schematics there, you then give it 12 volts. Uh, the Wi-Fi is, is basically the input side of that box. You then need to figure out what relay is doing what. And then you can become the relay and turn your lights on and off bring your leveling jacks up and down, extend and retract your slide rooms, bring your awning in and out because you then human are that relay. Okay. And, and if Wi-Fi goes down or you lose your phone or whatever, um, that would be your um, recovery. Okay. You then have to become the relay and touch those wires together to do that. You need to know your schematic. My nose is itching because the cat, um, you have to know your schematic and then, and then practice it. Um, you know, um, those wires, are probably going to have like a terminal on it. They're plugged into like this little post. So unplug that post. Now it's a wire. No big deal. Um, you could use a 12 volt battery pack like you guys have seen me do multiple times. And I've got, if I was in the shop again, um, this little wire harness that we make. And you can go from your battery pack with a fuse directly to that wire and see if it works like you expect it to. So that would be the recovery from that. Um, on that, a lot of times we'll get called in just to get people going again. We don't, they, we, we're camping, the thing's broken. We just need it fixed. And um, so then I become the relay. I'm the one that's making the connections with the physical wire, the physical motor, the physical light um, to make it work. 
so that would be my answer there. Okay, Scotty says. All right, Scotty, we're coming to you now. 2009 Suburban Water Heater SW12DEL. Okay. 110 EDC side stopped working. What okay. should I test or look for beyond the 110 issue to see if the heater is worth fixing versus replace? Okay, so um, on that Suburban, um, if you go to the front of it, Okay, we have, note to self, we have got to do these in the shop because <laughs> I can show you these things. Um, so you're going to go to your front of your water heater, take the cover off, and then on the bottom, you're going to see this big black um, cover. Okay, it's usually got three screws, and a lot of times a gas valve is in the way for one of the screws. We're going to take those three screws off and take that black cover away, and now you're going to look at the back side of that heating element. Okay, from right there, you're going to be able to tell a lot of stuff. So the first thing I want you to do is take one of those wires off, turn off your circuit. Kill, kill your 120 volts, but you're going to take either the black or the white wire off. You need to take one of the wires totally off, take a meter and put it in ohms, and you're going to touch where those wires would connect. And on those water heaters, you're looking for 10 ohms of resistance, 10 ohms. So therefore your flukes would work, right? <laughs> uh, we talked about the flukes at the beginning of the show. Um, so 10 ohms of resistance is what you're looking for on those water heaters. And that right there will tell you if your heating element has failed or if your heating element is good. If you don't get 10 ohms, heating element's bad. Um, so then the next thing, let's follow the circuit. Okay, so 120 volts on the Suburbans is gonna come in on the upper left-hand corner behind the wall. If you were, if your water heater was slid out, you'd see a, a junction box on the upper left-hand corner. So you need to make sure you have 120 volts at that point. Okay, great, you got 120 volts at that point. If you don't, then the problem's upstream. Let's say you get 120 volts at that point. The first thing it's going to do, it's going to go down to that rocker switch on the bottom left-hand corner. It's got to pass through that rocker switch. The rocker switches are 12 bucks, and I can't tell you how many of those rocker switches I've replaced while doing this. Um, so you take my little favorite tool, which is a little corner, that right angle pick thing, and you, your power's off, and you just kind of work that little switch out, and you can get at about an inch or two. It takes us an inch. And um, so you have 120 volts at your junction box. Do you have 120 volts at that switch? Great. I have it at the switch. Flip the switch. Does it make it through the switch? A lot of times it's a switch. I can't tell you how many times it's a switch. So it makes it through the switch. The very next place it goes is through your thermostat. And that's the cover up top with the little push buttony things with little rubber grommets. It's going to be the left hand, one of those things. You want, and they're going to be two little uh, thermostats. One's going to have the push button and one's not. It needs to make it through both of those. So we started our junction box through our switch. Now we're going to go through those two um, thermostats. And once it leaves there, it goes to the heating element. Okay. Um, so we're going to follow the trail. I have 120 volts here. Yes, no. Do I have it on the switch? Yes, no. Do I have it through the thermostat? Yes, no. And then now you know your, your heating element should be 10 ohms of resistance. Um, and so one of those things will cause it not to work. You just got to follow the trail and figure out which one is not not happy okay hope that helps ready for the next one i'm ready all right matthew says uh i have a dometic refrigerator and okay. every time i turn it to the electric side it blows the breaker ah okay um so on your dometic refrigerator what i'm going to want you to do is gain access to the back side of the refrigerator okay you're going to see more than likely what kind of refrigerator is it Dometic, oh, dometic, what number? It doesn't say. Okay, okay. Maybe you can post it in. Okay, it, overwhelmingly, you're going to see a black box. Um, depending on the model number, it might be on the left or on the right, but you're going to see a black box. And um, you'll need to take that cover off that black box. So that's the first thing you're going to do is take the cover off the black box. Then on your boiler, most of them are on the right-hand side, but some of them are on the left. You're going to find two larger size gauged wires they're going to leave this black box. You can actually start at the boiler and that's your heating element, okay? So the heating, heating element, it might be a black and a yellow. It might be two yellows, might be two blacks, might be white with yellow stripe, okay? So you're gonna find the two wires that come out of this candy cane looking thing. All you're gonna see is these little two wires. The rest of it's down inside the boiler, but you're gonna follow those two wires all the way over till it comes into that control board. And you're going to take those two wires off of the control board so you have the heating element separated from everybody. The heating element can stay in the boiler, but you have the, the back end of those two wires. Then you're going to take your meter, 
just like we did with a water heater. You're going to take your meter, put it in ohms, and you're going to stick it into those two connectors. We need to get the ohms resistance value from that heating element. Ballpark is 45 ohms, 44 ohms, but to really be accurate, that's usually my go, no go. I'm like, I know I'm close to 40 ohms, 45 ohms. That gets me close. What you're looking for there is if it's a dead short and it's just beeping like crazy, you do want some resistance to that heating element. And uh, maybe this will be a good video we could do. I can actually do a video where I'm actually doing some testing on these things where we read the ohms value on, on different heating elements. So if you're tripping your breaker every time, more than likely that heating element has failed. So if we follow that AC circuit, it starts at the little receptacle in the back of your refrigerator. You plug it into the wall. It goes directly into your board. On the board itself, it's got a glass fuse. I believe it's about a five amp fuse. It goes through that glass fuse on the back of your board through the little black relay that's soldered onto the motherboard, leaves a relay and ends up on the board on these two little pins. And that's where these two wires connect to. It leaves those two pins and goes to the heating element. So if you're blowing a breaker or, or something, a fuse from that process, I doubt it's the board that's tripping it. More than likely, it's the heating element that's tripping it. And so that's how you would test that. Um, on our website, we've got uh, myrvworks.com. We've got, I don't know how many manuals on refrigerators that we have there. So see if you can find your refrigerator on our manual section. I think it's myrvworks.com, resources tab, manuals. And um, find your refrigerator. Go to the reading where it contents, index, whatever, to find the sheet that's got all of the um, heating elements based off of your refrigerator model number and serial number. And it'll tell you how many watts, how many ohms of resistance, et cetera, at room temperature. And that would be how you would check to see if it's your um, we'll post a link. water heater. Oh, um, Anne's posting a link on the um, manual. Um, the manuals page. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to me like it's your heating element, but that's how you would prove that. If it's if it's in fact that's the problem, and then if you need to replace that, sometimes you need to shove your scoot your refrigerator forward just a little bit, just a wiggle, 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 wiggle. If it's really seized in there, that PB Blaster product is fantastic. Oh my gosh, I could that's squirt some on there and walk away, go drink a soft drink, and come back 20 minutes later and and wiggle, 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 and those things more than likely come out. That how that stuff works is amazing. But PB Blaster is my go-to for frozen heating elements. So. Um, and then we can put a link on uh, affiliate link. Yay. So someone just made a comment about hitting the like button um, for the live stream. So if you haven't done that already, hit the like Ooh, button. Ooh, yeah, hit the like button on the live stream. That's what Ann was saying. Well, Scotty was saying it, actually. Okay, yeah, Scotty was saying Scotty. it and Ann was, was relaying. So hit the like button. Yay. Okay. All right, this is fun. What else we got? Okay, so um, if we can uh, circle back just for a moment. Okay, we're going to go back. Um, so... Would there be a point at which you would decide that a water heater was, and maybe this applies okay. to any appliance, um, is worth re replacing versus fixing? Like, do you look okay. at what cost the repair is going to take versus what buying a new unit will cost? And at that point, and if you're still, and if you're troubleshooting, at what at what point do you decide? You know, do you always start with troubleshooting? Okay. Um, this is back to Scotty's question. We don't okay. have to spend a lot of time on it, but just kind of. So where's my break point on buying a new appliance versus trying to repair it? Yeah. Um, we did a water heater video several years ago. And um, I think that one was a Suburban. And we went deep. I mean, we replaced almost every component on that water heater. And a lot of the comments that we get from that, we'll go ahead and replace it. And that was that was a, a conversation I did have with a customer. And uh, I would have recommended the a full replacement on the water heater. But their decision was, let's just go ahead and go with this thing. It only needs at least to last another year, and then we're done. So um, if, if you guys have watched my... Oh, okay, so let's say that there's two ways I can answer this question. One is as an RV technician that makes a living fixing these things. And the other is as a person who has an RV that has a water heater that's broken that wants to fix it. So let me take it from you, RV owner that wants to fix your own RV. Step one, watch my YouTube videos. I go through so much. Well, YouTube are Rumble videos, okay? Because now we're on Rumble as well. Sorry, YouTube. We love you. you YouTube invited us to the party and we're going to be, we're not going to be switching dance partners, but we've got quite a few people asking us to put our content on another platform. So that that's all that is. Same, same content, just two platforms, okay? Um, and because we're just trying to, to 
provide a, 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 a product for as many people that some people won't be one on the other. So enough on that. So if, if it's your water heater that's failed and you need to make a decision on which um, to replace the whole thing or not, my go-to there is, is if the tank itself is intact, then it might behoove us just to go ahead and replace the pieces parts. If the tank is ruptured or cracked or failed or rusted, now if it's a Suburban and you have not replaced your anode rod and you pull that anode rod out and it's a stick, okay, and you start back flushing that and you see these little blue flakes of stuff out there, that's cancer. That tank will probably fail soon, okay? So the anode rod is important on a Suburban. Um, the Atwood slash Dometic water heater, those aluminum, you don't need an anode rod on aluminum because there's no rust taking place inside of aluminum. So if the tank was intact, then it might behoove you to just watch my video and figure out, follow the trail like we talked about on the water heater with the electrical side um, and figure out what's going on here. Um, I could probably do more videos on the gas side and I do have great plans. I've got a lot of data loggers sitting up there. I am going to have a fantastic field day with refrigerators. We're going to go so deep on refrigerators with data loggers. It's going to be very exciting. I'm already starting to gather some data and I'm seeing stuff about refrigerators I've never seen before, but we could throw data loggers on water heaters as well. So if the tank is good, I might leave it, leave the water heater in and just replace the pieces that it needs. Okay. As an RV technician, different kind of a question or same question, different answer. Um, I would start with a diagnosis. So you're gonna pay me to come out and I'm gonna figure out what's wrong. Now, if your tank is ruptured and leaking, by all means, all bets are off. You then have two options. You can replace the tank itself, just keeping all your guts and putting all your guts on the tank. I hate doing that. Um, it's just these rings that you gotta put on there are impossible. So I would just buy this the whole new water heater. Okay, so let me stay focused. If you're a professional and you're doing this for a customer, then I would say, let's at least get us out there to do a diagnosis, okay? We have a one hour check and advise where, where you're gonna pay us our one hour shop rate, which is for mobile service, we have a one hour flat rate. If we're gonna get me out there, you're gonna pay an hour for a flat rate to diagnose a problem or else why would I even waste my time to go out there when I got other customers that are willing to pay that hour? So it, that's just a business decision that we make. So we're gonna get out there and we're going to diagnose it. Now, once we diagnose it, so you've paid your hour, okay? But but if you're good and you're competent, you should be able to know exactly what that problem is within that hour. You've done your diagnosis, you've done your test, okay? So you might want to let your customer know like, look, you're going to pay this flat rate for me to figure out what the problem is. Then I always have a, a dialogue with my customer to find out, okay, this is what the problem is. This is how much the parts are going to cost. Um, this is the labor and then let that customer decide if they want to get a whole new water heater. I think water heaters are six, seven hundred dollars. Flat rate to swap out a water heater is 1.8 hours. So you take your shop rate times 1.8 is the flat rate to just swap out. Like if it's a suburban SW6, and you're going to take that out and put another exact one in just like it, and all the fittings are the same, you get 1.8 to do that for labor. If they are going to take out the tank and put in an on demand water heater, or they're going to take out um, an old Atwood and put in, see Atwood's gone. So now it's Dometic and Dometic water heaters are different. <clears throat> um, where the pipe, where the connections fit, the gas line is a little different. So, um, I consider taking out the Atwood and putting in a Dometic that is not a one-to-one -one because there's, you got to change plumbing lines. You got to change gas lines. Um, and I believe that's 2.6. Um, I think it's 2.6. Um, and then if you're going to put an on-demand water heater in, it's it's more. I, if you want, I could look those numbers up, but I don't have that with me. Uh, well, actually, I do. Uh, do you guys want to know the flat rates on water heater things, or am I wasting everybody's time? Let's put it. We'll put it. We'll post it. In okay, we'll post it in the comments. Later. Come back and read, because uh, we use Square, and I have it all right here on my phone. So, okay, carrying on. I'll right, keep so looking. We're going to do rapid fire because we just have a few minutes. Oh, rapid fire. Oh, okay, go. Yeah. So right. just try to give one or two sentences. If okay. You put on your seatbelt. Here we go. I'm ready. Go. Okay. And he's a fast talker, so. Hello, 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 hello. Okay. Um, just John, do you have any uh, undercarriage RV lights that you'd recommend? I know we usually don't make recommendations, but do you have any? Yes, lights? Right? Yes, undercarriage RV lights. No, I don't. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry. And LED. This, let's see. I don't know how rapid fire you can do this one, but it's an aqua hot, and we like those. I like so. aqua hots. Okay. Um, T 
Tim says, hi, I have an aqua hot when doing the fuel spray test, the fuel will stop right away. Then after three to five, I get a stream of fuel. Is that normal or do I have an issue? Well, that seems normal. Okay. Um, there's a way you can trick that. Um, so I'm going to go really fast and maybe I'll do a video on this. Um, so when on the aqua hot, you got your diesel burner and you're, you're trying to get that cloud of spray that I do in the video. That was an awesome video because it actually worked bad the first time and good the next time. So um, as long as that motor is running, the it, here's the here's the thing on that. I'm going to try to do rapid fire. As long as the aqua motor is running, okay, the fuel pump is running, and it's the fuel solenoid that opens and closes and allows the fuel to go in. Okay, so if you wanted to do that spray test, you can get an external 12-volt source like I use with my 12-volt batteries on my little homemade uh, that we sell for T3 interface uh, jumper thing. And then you don't have to worry about anything. You're sitting there. You could give 12 volts to the motor to get the motor to work. And then you can jump her off of that and get that solenoid to engage, give yourself a fuel source and, and get it to spray that way. Then you're not at the mercy of the control module um, looking for feedback coming back with um, there's that little windowy thing right there. And you can shine a flashlight on it to, to trick it. You can shine a flashlight to simulate that it's got more ohms resistance going back to the control board. Um, because if, if the control board is opening up the solenoid, it's going to strike an arc and it expects to see ignition. It expects to see an ohms value change on that little window. So you can shine a flashlight on that. Um, and if it doesn't, then it's going to be like, okay, we're shutting down. We're, we're not going to do that because I I got raw fuel going into this thing and I'm striking matches at it and it's not lighting. I'm stopping it. Um, so if you're trying to get your spray pattern, you can kind of come off to the side and give it a 12 volt source and then you can get it that way. And you, you, you then become the control board. Okay, there. Um, if you are, oh, this is L Rad. If you are servicing something on a customer's LP system, drop test is a given, but do you also check the smoke slash CO slash LP detectors every time as well? No, I don't. I don't. Okay, so the question was LP. I'm always going to do those three tests the, um, 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 the operating pressure test, then the uh, lockout pressure test, and then the leak test in that order. Um, but no, I normally don't. That's probably, I, it might be a good thing to do, but we use flat rate for all that. I keep mentioning that. And so there's a flat rate for testing the LP and there's also a flat rate for testing the CO and the LP and the um, smoke. And so I let the customer know, like we could do the whole safety thing and we do your LP, but no, I, when I'm doing LP pressure, I'm just working on the pressure. I'm making sure that the operating pressure is set. And, and on that, when you set your operating pressure, that's when you're at 50% load. That's what you set your regulator to. Okay. So you've got a 50% load, which is at number 41 hole. That's what you set your regulator to. You're looking for around 11 inches of water column at that point. Then you close everything off and that regulator better not go higher than 14 inches. If it goes higher than 14 inches after you've done your 50% load, then that regulator has failed because the most that regulator should allow through is 14. Um, then when we're done, I turn everything off, bleed it down to route eight, eight inches water column, and that's a three minute test. Um, and the only people that should do that are people that are highly trained in LP, that have their license, that have insurance, that have been to training, et cetera. So most of your RV DIYers, it's enough to know how to do it. But I know in Texas where we got started, you can get a lot of trouble working on RVs and not have an LP license. Um, it, on a side note, we moved up here to Washington. I We got calls for LP and I'm like, where do I go to get certified? Where do I go to get certified? And I mean, does my license in Texas transfer over to here? And I was in a Dometic training class and I was asking the question of the text, like, what are you talking about? So it turns out in Washington, <laughs> you don't have to be certified. So it's kind of kind of scary and, and weird, but uh, maybe it's the Southern states because there's so much more heat that they need to be a little bit more cognizant of it. I don't know. I don't know, but um, I'm still take LP very seriously. So there's my rapid fire answer on that. All right. We're going to end with uh, Bill who says, does Schwintech have a lot of issues with their wiring? I don't know if you want to answer that question or not, but we'll just okay. put it out there. Have a plug issue that only lets one motor run. Okay. Schwintech have a lot of issues with their wiring. Um, Schwintech in its purest form, no. Um, the problem is the set screw on the outside that gets in that little oval and holds the, the motor in place that will fall out. They'll not put it in. And then the motor bounces out. Um, it was fun because I did that video where I was doing that test of that Schwintech. And, and as I was showing people, the motor popped out and was spinning around. 
Um, now that's, I, I can't say that's Swintech's fault. So I'm not mad at Lippert because a motor pops out. They provide a solution where the screw holds a motor down. Um, and on their thin rack or thin wall system, there's actually a spring loaded deal that holds a motor down. So maybe Swintech could do a little bit better job holding their motor down. But um, the problem is the motor, the screw falls out, the motor pops up, and then the motor starts eating itself in the wires. So I carry a solder iron with me in my service trailer. And a lot of times the only problem is you just need to take some time because motors, well, we found some cheap motors on Amazon recently, like 50, 60 bucks for a motor. But normally the motors were closer to $270, $300. So it's worth it for them to pay me, you know, some, some shop time, some bench time to solder the wires back on and the motor's fine. So um, I also carry an extra harness, um, but the reason they're having problems with their, their wiring is because that set screw falls out and the motors eat themselves. How's that? Great. Okay. Well, we can end right at five or we can answer one more. Let's go one know? more. Okay, so we're at, we're at the hour. We said we go an hour. Okay. Um, so bill number two. Okay. Um, Pete is from Georgia. Hey, Georgia. Yay. And it says, he says, I have a rack and pinion slides out yeah. and slides in very slow at first and two thirds in okay. speeds up to normal speed. My question on that, okay, on the rack and pinion, I, I, I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. What I want you to do is when the thing's extended, I want you to go out there with your fingers and touch it and see if it's sticky. Puller spring lubricant on those rack and pinion systems. And for whatever reason, uh, Part of it dries up and it leaves a very sticky residue. And so in those situations, what I do is I um, really degrease it. Simple Green works really well. You could have your degreaser of choice, but Simple Green seems to just eat this stuff wonderfully. And <laughs> Oh, what? Oh, nothing. When you're done with your explanation, we'll have a funny thing to say. Okay. Okay. Um, Keep it down back there, ladies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so degrease it really well and see if that makes a difference. Now, the other thing it could be is if this is a drop floor, it might have a hard time, you know, coming up that ramp and coming over. Um, and again, um, degreasing and making sure that all the meshing and the gearing is nice and clean um, would really, really help that. So your first homework assignment is to make sure it's degreased and cleaned. If you are going to lubricate that, I might go with a dry Teflon. It goes on wet and then it dries because you don't want anything that's going to stay wet. I'm not a fan of silicone spray on anything. I don't even stock silicone spray in my service trailer. Um, I've moved over more to a, a Teflon type of a spray. And we've got the kind that goes on wet and stays wet. And we've kind that goes on wet and dries up. Um, I just lubricated my table saw just a little bit earlier. And I had a dry Teflon spray because it's raining and it's humid and, and my things are getting bad. So, um, so yeah, de degrease and lubricate and see if that doesn't make it better. Now, the fun thing to do on that is uh, if you have a clamp meter, what I, what I always like to do is read the amperage going out and back in before you do anything and then degrease everything and get it to work and then read the amperage of it going out and coming back in doing nothing but degreasing and look at the differences in your amp draw of what that motor is, is demanding to do its work. So, okay. What's this comment? Well, Sid writes in and he asks, how many blueberries are in a blueberry pie? True or false? <laughs> how many blueberries are in all of them? Okay. Yes, all, all right. of them. I think that um, we do have a few that we didn't get to, but I just don't think there's going to be a way for us to always get to all of the questions. But Okay. So um, to be fair to everybody, we're trying to keep these to, to an hour. Um and but what we would really, really, really value is if you guys gave us some feedback. This is our very, 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 very first live stream. And you guys have been awesome to help us in the beginning through some of our, our technical challenges and things like that. Um, and if it wasn't storming and raining, I think it'd be better for me in the shop or my service trailer or something like that where I can actually do some show and tell. And um, but I want to give a, a good applaud for, uh, for Trisha and Anne. There's no way I could have pulled this off without those two ladies, you know, chiming in and answering your comments. I'm not even reading this. this fire hydrant of <laughs> information here. They're feeding them off to me. So thank you for um, Ann and Trisha for that. And uh, But give us some feedback on things that we could do to make this better. Is the timing good for you? Is the day of the week good for you? How What frequency would you like us to do these on? Um, those th That will help us back here to figure it out. It's just the three of us. And then uh, Trisha's husband, Sid, he's a good one too to throw in. Um, and so it's basically the four of us running the show, unless we throw in the cats. 
Uh, we got some cats and the kids. Yes, we've got uh, our kids involved in this as well. So um, we do this for you guys and we're having fun. Um, Trisha didn't schedule me out in the field today and I'm glad because it's raining, but I get to hang out with you guys and answer questions. Um, but uh, yeah, like, subscribe. Uh, we're Like I said earlier, we're going to have some Patreon uh, videos that are specific just to our Patreon folks that are um, like the one we, I've, I recorded it the other day. It was a, a, a tour of my service trailer. Everybody wants that. So you'll have to go with a Patreon to do that one. So anyway, anything, ladies, that you want to add? Everybody's super nice. Thanks for saying we did all right. Oh, yeah, good. Okay. It. Thank you. Very I appreciate exciting. It. it was fun. Yeah, this was fun. Um, so I guess um, we'll see you next time. Leave some comments for us to chew on and, and make this product better. And um, we're in my RV that we bought uh, in 2007. We've been full-timing since 2007. This is our very first RV that we ever bought. And um, this was our kids' first home. Because as an engineer traveling around the United States doing airport jobs, this was what I went in. And so we've since gutted it, ripped out the carpet and just ripped everything out and uh, ripped out the bed and made this my office. And um, it makes a nice office. So yeah. anyway. Um, when we'll be on again, I think for sure, like the first, maybe like Friday of next month. Some, first Friday? Something like that. Uh, okay. Then, um, yeah. Okay. Oh, and then we get spam at the end. Oh, there's some spam at the end. Ah, so yeah. Um, let us know if this was valuable. We can, um, yeah. So what we'll commit to right now, I think with, with what Trisha's just saying is that, um, you know, at least once a month, but if this is really valuable and helpful for everybody, we could do more. Um, I'm willing to do more. Um, and it, it depends on getting the schedule of everybody together. And then also let us know if, if Friday at four works for everybody, we're trying to get the time zones in. And I you think know? we might, I, we'll just throw this idea out there. Um, we were thinking about focusing in on a specific topic. So okay. for example, if we wanted to do a live stream, like focusing specifically on furnaces or just some type of system or maybe um, an RV. Yeah. So just something like that. If, if you'd like to see something themes. more focused in. Yeah. Themes. Themes. Okay. Good deal. Yeah. I like that. And um, I believe Sid will take this and, um, make it a video that's a standalone that you guys can watch and um are the comments going to be part of that too or? i think so okay yeah. we're figuring this out hey this is this is fun this whole youtube thing has been quite an adventure for us so um i want to thank you happy camper say my rv works and um uh, what, uh subscribe so you stay on top of the latest okay okay uh they're signing they're giving me a sign to read so yes yeah, subscribe to the channel and that's how you know that we're doing this and um I'm I'm in guys. I'm 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 here for you guys. So we'll just figure out how best to because I'm still a working man out in the field and Trisha's still a working lady and Anne's still a working lady. So we're we're still working, but we're doing this for you guys. And um, but yeah, subscribe, like, share it with your friends, all the things I always say at the end. So all right, well, I'm gonna end this. So thank you guys for for staying with us and answering your questions. Hopefully I was able to help a couple guys, gals with their questions. And um, we still got more videos coming out. I think every Friday we'll have a video coming out. And um yeah. All right. I guess we're done. I get to go eat dinner now. Okay. All right. Good night, guys. Thank you for watching and thank you for your attention. Okay. Do From, you know how to end? I don't know how to end. What do I do? I hit the end live stream button. Okay. So, all right, guys, this is it. I'm going to say good night. Thank you. Your stream will stop immediately and you will no longer end. Okay.